All right, everybody, welcome to Unscripted One-on-One -on -one Podcast. And today I have a, another special guest. Um, as we have talked about uh, earlier on some other podcasts, uh, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So um, just kind of wanted to put a spotlight on awareness this month and share stories. So um, I would have my guest introduce herself and we will go from there. All right, well, first, thank you for inviting me on. And I know Heather had a lot to do with it, but um, yeah, I really appreciate it. and. I've enjoyed listening to some of the other ladies' stories or some of the Families with the Cure. That organization is wonderful. Um, so I think this is a great platform for people to share and hopefully people are listening. Yeah, um, well, yeah we'll see. <laughs> so thank you. Sure. <laughs> but uh, my name is Suzanne Glover. Um, we have my husband, I have a husband, um, three kids. I have a daughter who's a senior at Otterbein. Um, I have a son who's a freshman at Davidson and a daughter who's a seventh grader at Weaver. Wow. So we're all in Hilliard. We've been here for about 15 years now. So I grew up in a small town about an hour and a half west of here and then we moved to the big city. So yeah. we've been here for about 15 years. Yeah. Okay. All right. And um, and I think our families, well, our, have, you know Heather well from swimming. Mm -hmm. uh, I think swimming. Cross paths yes. and swimming quite a bit. So uh, yes. a lot of hours in the... Uh, pool, I guess, for a lack lot of a better of term. Yeah. <laughs> a lot, a lot of, of hours. Uh, so. waiting. waiting time around the pool leads to lots of talk time around yes, the pool. Lots, the lots, lots and yeah. lots of talk time. But um, yeah. well, so thank you again. Thank you so much for, for being a part of this. And, and as you said, Heather kind of put out a message on my behalf, um, asking people to, you know, to share their story. And um, as you said, it's, it's so powerful that people would want to come forward and and share just if nothing else just for the awareness and to, to have other people hear their story and and if like i've said if if one person hears this and it, it whether it gives them courage or whether it gives them hope or whether it gives them um you know a little bit of peace if they're walking through this now then, then it's always worth it so um with that can you you know take us through your journey um, you can go as far back as you would like, or if you could take us, you know, whatever you feel comfortable with in your story, if you could share maybe a little bit of your story with us, we would really, really appreciate it. Sure. Um, I think I, I first from Katie's, Katie Slidek's video that you did, um, <clears throat> you brought up the word uninvited. Yeah. And that really resonated with me mm -hmm. um, because that's exactly what this is. Yeah. It is totally uninvited, any type of cancer any diagnosis, I mean, really any type of family issue like that. Um, it's totally uninvited and it, it just messes up everything. <laughs> well, it's just a big bump in the road, I guess, mm -hmm. depends how you look at it. So um, that that really resonated with me and I've been kind of marinating on that. Yeah. But uh, my story, actually, I, I couldn't figure out where to start, but <laughs> I grew up with, um, my dad was sick our whole lives. He had two heart transplants by the time he was 50. Um, like he, he just had a heart condition, but I was raised in a Christian home. We were very joyful and thankful. Yeah. I don't know how my parents did uh, raise four kids on one income like yeah. they did. And we lacked for nothing. And I asked my mom later, she just said, we prayed and gave it to God. And that's how it went. So wow. people would laugh at us because we kind of make jokes a lot about dad being sick or his theme song was staying alive. I mean, we would sing. sing. So, I mean, we're very lighthearted. And, mm -hmm. and and I think I, that led a lot to the way I've reacted to this diagnosis. <clears throat> and then, um, so moving forward in 2012, my mom was actually diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, hers was sudden. Um, she had kind of had an opposite, did not have a lump that she found. It was on the outside of her skin, mm. went in to had it checked. And um, my sisters and I lived close by and we rallied around her and we were with her through the whole process of getting checked. And really, I had not known anyone personally, I guess, or close to me that had breast cancer. And I think you mentioned this on another call is once you see a car, a certain color, yeah. a certain yeah. kind, yeah. Yes, you notice that mm -hmm. everywhere. Yeah. And so that's kind of how it started for me. My mom got diagnosed. I really didn't know of many people. And then all of a sudden it's everywhere. Yeah. Um, so we were with her when she got her diagnosis and hers had this little tiny spot had metastasized to her bones. Mm -hmm. So she was immediately stage four um, yeah. bone cancer, metastasized from her breast cancer. So 
you know, even at that point, we were still naive and did not understand the process. Um, she was going to have a lumpectomy. My brain, it's done. It's gone. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to move on. She's yeah. taken care of. That's not how it works. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there's just, it just keeps going and going. And especially when it's in your bones or any other organ at that stage, it's a long, it's a, it's a tough road yeah. for sure. So, um, we had done that for four years, uh, with her, uh, her fourth year in is when I was diagnosed. I actually, um, found my own lumps, um, just one day and, and, I had a circular, very circular one, and I thought, nah, it's a cyst, it's fine. I'll go get it looked at eventually. And um, then, of course, it, women must, ha they have to do their checks. So you know your own body. I think yeah. that's your, the number one key to identifying any type of change in, in you is you know yourself. So I knew that wasn't right. And, and then I found another lump that was kind of, I said, it's kind of like a jellyfish. It's kind of like a jellyfish. Okay, we had a little bit of a connection issue there. So uh, back to, you were said you were doing some self-examination. Yeah, um, so I found this other spot that didn't feel quite right. And that's kind of an indicator that something may be more, if it's not circular um, or hard or, you know, so that's one of the signs they say to look for. So I, I remember being in my bedroom, finding it and thinking, oh no. And then went downstairs to the kitchen to my husband and I said, can you feel this? And he's like, uh, yeah, what does that mean? And I said, well, I think it means I need to go to the doctor. Wow. So we started, yeah, I mean, that's, and then you, the hardest thing through this whole process, I think is the waiting yeah. and you have days and it, it's, you know, doctors, nurses see this all the time, but when it's you personally, it's such a hard thing to do the waiting, the waiting for a test result, the waiting to get in to see somebody who can right. give you an answer. And even just starting the process, um, I still had to go to one doctor, had to give a referral to another doctor and then had to get another ultrasound and then had to do, I mean, so it's, it's just constant. So um, interestingly, since my mom was diagnosed, so that we, she did not do any ge genetic testing or anything. Um, I also found out when, after I was diagnosed, my dad's brother had a chest mastectomy. Mm. So for men, it's very, it's rare, right. not as common. You don't hear about it, but he also had chest, they call for men, it's chest cancer. So my dad had passed away a long time ago. So he's the next closest person. So based on that information and my mom having it, um, I decided to go ahead with genetic testing as well. Um, so that was another waiting process. Um, but I feel like through the whole time, I, I just wanted first available for everything. I, whoever's yeah. available. I went to, I went to doctors for an MRI. I went to grant for a biopsy. I went to yeah. Dublin and had the surgery. So wherever they could fit me in. And the whole time I just felt like, um, God was leading the way to the process because I got in quick. Um, I think I waited from the from the final time the biopsies came back and I got the diagnosis um, was about five weeks out till surgery, which is great because lining up plastic surgeons and the breast surgeon and everybody, it really did go quick. Um, but even the surgeon I got, they, I remember having the ultrasound done and they slid two pictures to me and said, you need to pick a surgeon. And again, I was like first available, whoever yeah. can see me, I don't yeah. know, I don't know these people. And the, the gal that I got, Dr. Uh, Holly Harvey is her name, is a breast cancer survivor as well. Wow. She is a breast surgeon with Ohio Health and a year before had just gone through this entire process. So as a woman, I just felt like, wow, because she really gets it. Yeah. I felt like I was very fortunate to be able to get with her and she is amazing. That's awesome. That all, all the way all of that happened is 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 awesome i mean that just to when i say that's awesome um that's amazing that that all took place at the same time so you had just finished telling and again we, we had some connectivity issues but um you had mentioned just the way that it seems like almost god went before you in that um you found all the right doctors at all the right times and all the right things i i get that because i i i don't like waiting at all and i can only imagine the um the circus that my mind would be waiting for each appointment waiting for results waiting for all those things I would I would be so 
I would be a mess. I'm just not a good um, waiter, I guess would be the word. I don't know. But um, so I think I think I'd probably do the same, like just give me first available. Let's let's go. And then I think did you have a did you feel like you had a, a, a like an hourglass in your head that said, I've got to you know, the sooner I can get in, the sooner we can get or, you know, like if, if this is taking too long, this is going to delay, you know, my recovery or, or my, pro, you know, prognosis. Mm -hmm. So did, did you feel that way? And is that why you kind of sped up? Or was it just like, I just want to get this over with as soon as possible? No, I feel like my perspective was, okay, I have cancer. And what do we do to get it out? Yeah. And get get it gone. So that was my perspective is how quickly can I get in to get this out of me? Yeah. Um, you call it a circus. We called it the dark side, letting our yes. minds go to the yes. dark side. Just because I know what the word says about controlling your thoughts, and but we're human. So right. it's just natural for your thoughts to go down that path. And I think it's okay to think about it, but not dwell on it. Right. So that was our the, the key parts for us is, um, I remember Mike came home from work one day and I was just sobbing and he's like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, I looked on the internet and found all oh. these videos. And he's like, why would you do that? I'm yeah, like, I right, don't know. Right, so, right, yeah. <laughs> so we just had moments of where you feel, you almost have to, you have to go there and then reel it back in yeah. and, and be like, okay, but here's where we're at right now. And, yeah. and this is all we know. Um, and I think that's where um, my journey has been the most impactful. I'm not a pink ribbon girl. I'm not, I know there's a group, but I mean, I don't, I'm not out there loud. I don't wear pink every day. I don't have a, a magnet on my car. That's just not me. Yeah. But if anyone has, or I should say anyone, not anyone, people have come to me asking when their friend has been diagnosed, could I talk to them? Yeah. And I'm finding that it's, in anything with life it's the indecision that causes the most chaos and um in your mind yeah whether you make a decision or not if it's whether it's good or bad once you have a decision you can move forward yeah and then you deal with whatever you decided yeah. so i feel like it's where i'm the most helpful with women right now and the people i've met along the way is helping them through this waiting time because it's horrible because yeah. you can't think especially moms with young kids not that it's good for anybody but you worry about them and it's I learned with my husband checking in with him is you know how are you doing because as a wife and his friend we're first yeah I mean the kids are great and they're wonderful but it's really us first yeah. so checking in with him and thank god he's a rock but um you know there's those parts of it that you forget about because you're so focused on you and, and what's inside of you and how are we gonna get rid of it? So it's just a journey, but I find like that that is where my place has been and how I can use the story to help others or help other women. I, in fact, yesterday afternoon, I sat with my neighbor two doors down and she let me know that they just found a spot and she was going to get her MRI today. So here we go and it stinks. Yeah. And I just, she's, she said, can I talk to you today? Do you have time? And I'm like, of course. And when we sat down, I said, I was hoping this wasn't what we were going to talk about, but yeah. you know, but I'm glad I can help because I don't feel like I'm doing much, but I, the feedback I get is, okay, you really helped me just sort through my thoughts. And, um, so that's where I feel like my most helpful part of this journey has been in the waiting with yeah. people and helping just get through that. Because once they find out what the next step is, it is, it, it, whether it's a surgery or if it's um, chemo, radiation, you have a decision and you can move forward. And you know then, okay, here's what we're doing. But until that point, it's very chaotic in your brain, like a circus, yeah. going to the dark side, you can't help it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mm -hmm. think there's a tension that you probably have to walk in it, because you're a parent and a spouse. There's a tension you have to walk between preparing yourself and your family for whatever that might be but not going too far out on that fringe like you said going on the internet i was going to ask you did you ever, you know because i think that's the first thing i would do and pro most of us do even though we know in the back of our mind when i go on the internet it's going to tell me terrible things um which you know most of them are not realistic because each journey is different each you know diagnosis is different but i would think that i would probably go there and then read some things on the internet and now i'm freaking out and I have three children and a spouse that I have to be thinking about. So 
you know, like you said, bring it back to, there's just a tension that relies there that I, I still have to be, for, for me, it's a provider protector for my home or my, you know, I have to be the husband and the dad that I need to be for you, you know. Um, is that kind of where you found yourself was was walking in between those like, okay, I can't get too far out because I still got a lot of things that people relying on me as a, as a friend told me once. Um, but also taking time to say, I have to, I have to be honest and say, I'm, I'm scared or I'm, I'm going to fight them, you know, whatever it means. Mm -hmm. uh, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think, um, yes, as a mom, my front in front of my kids is brave yeah. and we got this. And, um, at the time, um, the two littles were 10 and eight. So I just kept it at their level. Yeah. I'm having a surgery. You know, that my mom, we called her mama, mama has cancer. Um, and so they've heard the word and they knew she had been, she's been diagnosed with it. And we've been dealing with that with her. Um, but I'm not like mama because she had chemo and lost her hair, all that good stuff. I'm not that like mama, but I do have to have a surgery. I'm going to have tubes in me and I'm going to look like an alien when I come home. And they were like, okay, cool. You know, so kind of kept it lighthearted as best as I could. But I yeah. think I, my sisters were the best. Um, they were a great resource for me because they'd have already gone through the journey with my mom as well. Um, but, and then just behind closed doors, either by myself or with my, my husband, yeah. we'd really get to the like, okay, I need to vent, I need to get this out. And yeah. I'm feeling overwhelmed right now because in that waiting after diagnosis before a surgery, um, you have so much to prepare for. You know it's coming, you know you're gonna be down for a few multiple weeks you can't drive you know your husband could take off maybe a week or so but he's got he had to go back to work it's just yeah. like having a baby yeah. <laughs> you yeah. only get a short amount of time off hmm. um who's gonna help us we were in the middle of swim season for the summer and oh. of course i had two kids at two different times yes, so how, right. how am i gonna get them there right. you know and i was very um my other the the biggest thing i learned was ask for help because i'm a very i'll do it myself and I love to give to others. I love I love to serve. That's my thing. I I find great joy in that. But when people want to give to me, I'm like, oh, I'm good. Yeah. I'm fine. Yeah. I'm fine. So, um, in fact, I have a shirt that says I'm fine from a, a friend. <laughs> <Fine>. right. <laughs> I said it too much. I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I had to start calling people and I had to rely on them for help. I had to have people bring us meals because I that I had a bilateral mastectomy. I went in, um, they tested lymph nodes and they came back clear, but in surgery, they came back positive. So I ended up, um, my procedure was 10 and a half hours. So they ended up having to take lymph nodes out and all that good stuff, which wow. is great. I'm glad they found it then. But, yeah. um, so I had a lot more other things going on, not just in just a mastectomy. So, um, I had to have help. And, and then I ended up, I had an infection that caused me to kind of go back a couple weeks in recovery, mm. um, things like that. So there's just a lot of hiccups along the way in recovery. Um, yeah. But I had to learn how to ask for help mm -hmm. and take it graciously and be thankful that I had a community of people because really I think that's key too. You can't do this without without help. You can't not have people help you. and and it's important to let people help you. I learned yeah. that <laughs> because that's, they need to, they need to give too. Yeah. So yeah, I learned that along the way as well. <laughs> a lot I of remember lessons. that from a, a friend of mine that, that, um, that walked through cancer and, and um, I remember him telling me that once and, and he was stage four, but um, I remember two things actually that you've said. One was, I remember when he had his first surgery and they came out and he was stage four, like I said, and they came out and they're like, we got 98% of it. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, so is he good? Is he like stage two now? Or does that change it? And it was like, no, he's he's never going to not be stage four. And that was so hard for me to wrap my head around. I didn't understand that because I, th I, I thought you said you got 98%, you know? And um, so that was one thing, but I do remember him telling me because he was a servant at heart and he would always give to others before, long before his diagnosis, that was just who he was, it's the way he was wired. And so for him to say, I need help, I remember him telling me that was one of the hardest things that he said too, was mm -hmm. being willing and, and being okay to have somebody else come over and cut the grass or somebody else come over and, you know, paint or, or 
go to the grocery store, whatever it was for him, he had such a hard time doing that because he was a servant at heart and that was a shift. And so the last thing I think any of us want to do is put more stress on someone walking through that journey. We want to be a helpful. And I, I, some, and I don't remember if it was him or someone telling him that he then told me, somebody told him like, you have to allow people, you're, you're robbing them of the, the joy of helping when you say no, you know? And I think that is when he finally accepted it was at least the help that he got was when, when somebody told him flat out, you're, you're, you're robbing them of their joy. You're stealing that from them because they want to help you and they are gifted to help you and you're taking that away from them. So that was something I remember from his and, and um, certainly something for at least all of us, you know, to remember when we, because I think that's the thing too. What do you, what do you, you we, we, none of us know what to say. You know, there's all the quotes and the cliches and we want to be helpful, but you know, it probably gets old after a while hearing all the same cliches and, and you know, when you're walking through it, but keeping in mind that people are just trying to help, you know, they just want to be helpful. So that's, yeah, they don't, it, it is, it is hard. I totally agree with that. Absolutely. hundred percent. It's hard to, hard to ask for it. It's hard to accept it when you're used to giving it, but you have to, yeah. you have to learn how to do that. And, and you're, you're, it's, it's your way of giving to those people and letting they have to people want to help you somehow yeah so yeah yeah what's what does the future look like where where are you today and are you continuing to do testing and those things or what does the future look like where do you so want the, to start yeah so the question i think i was going to ask you next is um what where are you currently and where are you in the future how often do you have to test and all those things now that we, you know, where you, where you are, where you are? Yeah. Um, so for me, um, let's see, I, <laughs> I'm four years out from diagnosis. Um, uh, because it went through my lymph nodes, I, uh, I see an oncologist every six months. Um, to be honest, I don't ever, well, I don't ever. I rarely think about this process until someone approaches me or it's October where it's um, more awareness, um, yeah. but really on the day to day, it's not something I dwell on or think about until those visits come up. And, and again, going to the dark side, you just yeah. gotta control. I have to control my mind and my thoughts and know that you know God's still in control regardless of whatever the result of this test will be we'll deal with it again. But, um, so I go to an oncologist every six months, I go to my surgeon. Um, I still visit her once a year. Um, and while I don't have to have mammograms or, um, any, there's nothing, no tissue there, they're checking still to see if there's any, um, changes in shape or around the, the tissue that's there now, is there any ab abnormalities? So they're checking for that as well. So um, every six months at the oncologist, once a year at the surgeon, um, yeah, it's, it's just a process. I think um, my takeaways from, from this journey is one, mammograms are the best um, way to detect early detection for, for cancer for women. There's no blood test, there's nothing else that they can do at this time. Yeah. So do the mammograms. Um, like my kids now, my girls, even my son, I guess, um, are now because of my mom we're 10 years earlier and now because of me it's two years or, or 15 i don't know they're going to be young and they're yeah. going to have to start testing yeah. um i did i did have genetic testing done and i don't we don't have the BRCA gene but we do have a um or i have a variation of a gene they just don't know a lot about it yet so now i mean the long lasting effects is my girls are high risk forever yeah. All of our family will be high risk. My son is high risk. Technically, he needs to be checked. Um, my nieces, my sisters, because of our mom. I mean, it's just, it, it travels and keeps going and going. It doesn't stop. And I think that was the biggest shocker. Like, even with my mom, we learned, okay, she gets it taken out, you're done. Yeah. You're not done. It's yeah. not ever done, you yeah. know? So, um, yeah, that, that was the takeaway. And then... Um, I can't remember what else I was going to say. Um, do your checks, get those done. Um, and, and mostly in, in yourself, women need to, women know their own bodies. Yeah. So do your own self checks. There's yeah. a lot of videos out there and, and graphics of how to do that, but you really, women know themselves the best. 
So if you feel something weird or something odd, it's worth it to go. It's a 10 minute test, you know, even the mammogram, it does not take that long. And early detection is the key. When you find something, it can be, you know, I know a lot of women that are just centimeter spot, taken out, done. Yeah. Um, you know, and then you just go on. It's a long journey and it's still a process, but boy, that would be, I mean, how great to find it early yeah. and be able to get it taken care of. Mine, I've been having yearly mammograms and they put one slide up next to the other. And within a year, my left breast was full of tumors. So, but it had only been a year and they called it slow growing. I thought it was kind of fast, but Goodness. yeah. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. So for me, um, a lumpectomy wasn't an option which is fine i was more and that's another thing it's very personal yes what women decide to do and how they move forward whatever and i let there's laws that protect women to make those decisions yeah. um however long it takes which is so important now that i've been on this journey i it's so important to not have to feel rushed or pressured um and there's a lot of different ways to go about um getting it out and being reconstructed not reconstructed and it's all good it's just very personal decision though um how people move on so and then uh for me i'm on tamoxifen but I, you've probably heard that now yeah, a few times yeah. mm -hmm. um i actually had to have a hysterectomy <laughs> right after the mastectomy um because uh uh, ovarian cancer and breast cancer go together yeah so I was having issues there and it was just decided it was probably a good idea just to have a, a complete uh, total hysterectomy at the time um, I've also had melanoma cancer skin cancer which is now they're finding it's connected to breast cancer as well Wow. so there, yeah so there's a lot of things going on with my, my my body but it's early detection i go to the dermatologist i go to my doctor appointments most of the time i i don't know if it's worth it or not but i go anyway because yeah. it's important i i want to be here a while right so right. that's what we do so i take take this med i have to take it for 10 years um just until they i'm sure in 10 years from now they'll have something else so yeah. you know i look forward to that but yeah, it's been a journey, but we don't, we're joyful, we're happy, our family's doing great. Um, I'm glad I can help other women. I don't, you know, a lot of people, I don't believe God caused this to happen or anything, but I feel like there's something in the journey that is meant for me to share with others. Yeah. So I think that's important, is that not to keep it to myself yeah. and to actually share it with people. So that's kind of what I try to do. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think you said it so well. I, I don't think God allow or God causes, but I think he allows sometimes. And when we can take away from that and, and, and you know, it could be that it's just to help others, like you said, like your neighbor, like you said earlier. Um, and, and, you know, it is it is early prevention. I mean, it's so crazy. Like and that was the other thing I remember, too, is my friend just like, I, you know, you break your arm, you get a cast, you're better, you know, six weeks, eight weeks, you, you have, you know, if you tear up your knee, you have a knee surgery, you're better. Like he just, you know, and I just had such a hard time getting around that. Like he's supposed to get better. We're like medicine, yeah. but we have come so far. I have uh, an earlier podcast today, um, which it was in the eighties and her mom found out and they were treating her breast cancer. In the meantime, it had metastasized to other places and, and we're so much further ahead now. Uh, in terms of advances and testing and all those kind of things than we were then. So um, is there any other resources that you found very helpful that, that I can include uh, either in the blog post or that anybody listening to this were there? It's interesting. You said Ohio Health. I, I think um, we had someone else that was at Ohio State and then <laughs> and maybe both were at Ohio Health. I can't remember, but but it's been interesting. Everybody's been somewhere different and they've all had great mm -hmm. experiences. So um, what, yeah. what resources do you have? I don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> I kind of just went online. Um, you know, I have people ask me all the time, did you go to the James? Did yeah. you get to the Spielman Center? And honestly, um, Ohio Health is connected with MD Anderson, connected with who's a leading cancer specialist, you know, um, their protocols and the things they follow 
align with that. So I just let people know I had a great experience and if I hadn't, or I felt like something was going wrong, sure, I would have switched, but I didn't need to. But I think we're just fortunate in Columbus we have amazing resources here, and it's not like they don't share with each other. So yeah. Ohio State doesn't learn information and not share it with Ohio Health. Yeah. So they are sharing amongst each other too. So we, we really get the best of both worlds. And we have world renowned doctors that are, we're, are here in Columbus. So I, we're fortunate, very fortunate for that. Um, but no, I, I sadly, I don't have a specific resource or anything I went to necessarily. Um, I think they give you overload of information. So I kind of processed it my own way, I guess. And I, I did look on the internet a lot, but mine was more for, I wanted to, I wanted to know, I had um, invasive and I had, there's two types that are in the ducts, milk ducts, and then the kind that comes out, I have both. So I just wanted to know what was that all about? And, and I wanted to know more about the, the cancer itself. Yeah. Um, and there's no rhyme or reason why it comes like, my family were just unlucky I guess we don't have any genes but um, you know it's just that mutation of a, of a cell and off you go but early detection is the key and I, I read I I understand what you're saying because when my mom was diagnosed and she they wanted to do a lumpectomy and we thought then she's she's done right. it's all gone yeah and even while she was in treatment her bones were healing because of some of the chemo she was on. Yeah. So they were mending. So it was kind of like bone cancer is like having fractures all over your body. Mm. Um, they were healing. So we're like, oh, she's she's getting better. Yeah. No, she's not. Yeah. <laughs> she was not getting better. It just at the moment, that was what was working. Yeah. But she was always going to be stage four, always at a high risk. So um, yeah, and for her, it, it, it did end up going to her liver and she passed away five years after her diagnosis, yeah. but at 65, so young. Yeah. So I want to do what I can to be yeah. here. And, um, you know, if it's going to an oncologist every six months and I take a pill every day, then that's what I'll do. Yeah. You know, so. Well, I'm sorry that, that she passed, uh, Suzanne. And, and I just, like I said on one of the other podcasts, I'll be glad when this con these this conversation, <laughs> not this one between you and I, but but the topic yeah. of this conversation is no more. Um, that yeah. would be a great day. And and until then, um, we just have to keep. I know they're they're doing everything that they can. At least you know I hope that they're doing everything they can to extend and and get early detection and get those things done. So um, I know you said that that you tend to be private with with this journey and and you know unless asked and. Um, Heather put that out you came on and so thank you for that um, knowing that you yeah you tend to keep it private thank you for doing that thank you for being a resource I know someone's going to hear this and there will be something that you said um, that will will help them and, and so I'm very thankful for your time well you're welcome and I hope if if anyone's listening and I though I am more of a private person I'd be willing to talk to anybody so if you ever have anyone um, you know, and I think most women would, but if they just need that voice of someone who's been through the journey, I think that's important to know that their thoughts are okay. What you're thinking is okay. Yeah. Going to the dark side is okay for a moment. Um, and, and you'll get your answers, but it's that moment of waiting. That's hard. Yeah. Um, but you'll get through Yeah. and there well, you'll have that decision and be able to move forward. And to be that voice of, of peace and calm. Uh, especially as mm -hmm. someone who's gone through that already, um, mm -hmm. what I'm, I'm sure for someone mean the world. So um, thank you. God bless you and your family. I'm Welcome. sure I'll see you guys around the pool. Hopefully we're <laughs> again at some point soon. I know I, I know. Just dying to get in the pool. <laughs> to, uh, With fingers crossed, there might be some news coming soon. So, yeah, I hope I so. Agree. I hope so for them, for the kids. But um, thank you so much for stepping out You're and welcome. to share your story and, and for taking the time. Of course. Tonight. All right. Well, God bless. You're we'll talk well. to you soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.